things that didn't go right is uh, I misplaced half of the notes, so thankfully we have cell phones now. <laughs> Pathfinder induction. Um, just raise of hands, how many people here are, have been Pathfinders? I love that response. That's about more than half of the church, right? That is awesome. We're honored here today because we have two area coordinators with us. Um, it's just great. We have all kinds of people. This is a very solemn, very special ceremony. The induction ceremony is when we welcome in new Pathfinders into the club. As the Pathfinder director, I now call the Pathfinder induction service in order. First thing that we're going to do is to light the spirit of the Pathfinder candle. Hopefully. There we go. For the light of our program, we turn to the spirit of pathfindering. The candle that I just lit represents the spirit. It is the spirit of adventure, fun, learning, camaraderie, awareness, and awakening, and above all, the spirit of reverence. It is the spirit of service to God and man. This light in and of itself is not sufficient. To introduce the complementary lights, I'm going to uh, ask Christina, our deputy, or our assistant director, to come forward. As you come into Pathfinders, you start in the, first, uh, the, in the fifth grade, 10 years old, um, the friend class. Uh, and this is where technology is great sometimes. Okay. The Pathfinder friend class is a course of study in spiritual awareness, intellectual learning, mental skills, and physical fitness, and will enable the young Pathfinder to be a better neighbor to the church and the community a friend of God throughout eternity. The Pathfinder Companion is a course of spiritual growth and development and learning, man manual skills and physical fitness that will enable the growing Pathfinder to acquire a deeper meaning of life and a meaning of companionship with the one Lord Jesus Christ. Every hour of every day. The Pathfinder Explorer is a course of study in spiritual development, mental growth, and learning, mental skills, and physical fitness that will enable the developing Pathfinder to discover new methods, new experience, and adventures in exploring God's written word and his created works. That's what we're learning about this year, that God's second book. The Ranger class is a course of study including spiritual, mental, physical development that will lead the Pathfinder to new areas of discovery in the natural world together with a new and deeper spiritual understanding that will open the way to greater happiness and genuine fulfillment. The Pathfinder Voyager class is a course of study that will encourage and lead the more mature Pathfinders to dedicate themselves more fully to accepting a deeper and broader understanding of God through a diligent and consistent study of his written word and to the marvels of his evident in his created works as seen through the book of nature. See how everything comes back to God's second book. The Pathfinder Guide is a course of study that emphasizes personal growth and spiritual discovery. Guides the more mature pathfinders to the development of new survival skills matures the development of leadership skills and strengthens the commitment to being a dedicated servant of God and a friend to man. 
the Master Guide class, is a course of study including deeper spiritual insight, greater mental and intellectual growth, and greater, more mature candidate to become a leader and role model who will influence young people and lead them to acquire greater knowledge and deeper understanding of our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ as creator of the universe, savior and redeemer of mankind, and our soon coming king. I would like to invite the Pathfinders up to light the candles for our Pathfinder law, or our Pathfinder pledge. Sir, I represent the one who pledges by the grace of God, which means I will rely on God to do his will. Awesome. Sir, I represent the candle who pledges I will be pure, which means I will rise above the wicked world in which I live and keep my life clean with words and actions that will make others happy. Sir, I represent the candidate who pledges I will be kind, which means I will be considerate not only to the people around me, but also to God's creation, the animals, and the environment in which I live. Sir, I represent the one who pledges I will be true, which means that I will be honest in study work or play and will always do my best. Sir, I represent the one who pledges I will keep the Pathfinder Law, which means I will understand the Pathfinder Law and live up to it. I represent the candidate who I represent the candidate who pledges I, I will be a servant of God, which means I will put God first in everything. Awesome. Sir, I represent the one who pledges I will be a friend to men, which means I will treat others like I want to be treated.
On behalf of the Scottsdale Thunderbird Path, uh, Pathfinder Club, I accept your pledges to keep the Pathfinder Pledge. Oh, I would invite now the Pathfinders to come and light the candles for the law. Don't worry, we have lighters this time. Sir, I represent the one who, who hereby vows to keep the morning watch, which means I will have prayer and person personal Bible study each day. Awesome. You hold it down and then squeeze. Hold it down. Hold it down. There you go. Squeeze. There we go. It's got it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir. I represent the candle who hereby vows to do my honest part, which means I will do my share of the work and be there when other people need me. Sir, I represent the candidate who hereby vows to care for my body, which means I will not put anything harmful into my body, and I will stay physically fit. Sir, I represent the candidate who hereby vows to keep a level eye, which means I will not lie, cheat, or talk dirty. Sir, I represent the one who hereby vows to be courteous and obedient which means I will think about other people's feelings and do what I am asked. Sir, I represent the candidate who hereby vows to walk softly in the sanctuary, which means I will be quiet during church and worships. Sir, I present the one who hereby vows to keep a son in my heart, which means I will try to always be happy even when I don't feel like it. Sir, I represent the one who hereby vows to go on God's errands, which means I will always be ready to tell people about Jesus. Awesome. On behalf of the Scottsdale Thunderbird Pathfinder Club, I accept everyone's pledge to keep the Pathfinder Law. Let's pray. 
Pathfinder's attention, parade rest, prayer attention. Good afternoon, Father. Good morning still. Thanks so much for these wonderful, wonderful people. Thanks that they've dedicated to, to honor you, to just have a lot of fun with Pathfinders, but not just join Pathfinders to have fun, but because they want to get closer to you and because they want to show you to others. Please bless them. Please lead them. Please come into their hearts and just draw them closer to you every day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Attention. Follow up. The reading comes from um, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, and he could not see. And Eerie the Lamb of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So say you want to grow good leaders. You want to grow your children to be good leaders. What are some things that you want to do? I want to, this is the participation part. Just throw some ideas out there. What might you want to have to, to produce good leaders? Honesty. What else? Reliability. Anything else? Okay, do good things, not bad. Kindness. Integrity. All good things. Reverence. All very good things. Today, I hope you guys brought Bibles, if not cell phones. Um, we find that, you know, modern technology helps. Let's pause for one moment before we get into the sermon. Just to... Ask God to lead. Good morning, Father. Whew. Thanks again for this privilege. And once again, I don't want my words to be spoken, but yours. Please lead in our study and, and show what you want to show and speak what you want to speak. Let's see what you have to say to us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, everybody, when they talk about leadership, and especially young leaders, they go to Timothy. You know, the whole don't let people look bad on you. When you're... But I want to look at somebody else that is a great, great leader who started out really young. I love to hear pages turning. Now, let's start out in 1 Samuel. It's just before 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1. First, let's look at the environment that Samuel grew up in or was born into. Even better, let's look at the environment that Samuel was born into. The first thing, you would like the child to be in a good environment, right? So 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to start out with verse 1 and go to verse 2. Now, there was a certain man from Ramath Zophan, please, if I mispronounce that, let me know later, from the hill country of Ephraim. And his name was Elkanan, or Elkanah, son of Jerome, and son of, and his son of, son of, right? Uh, verse 2 He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. 
And we see that right away there's problems in the home. As you read through that chapter, you find out that Hannah believed in God. She loved God so much. She, uh, she, she trusted in him so much that when she had problems and she couldn't even eat for how much stress was being put on her, the person she turned to was God. That's awesome. So we know that Hannah loved and followed God. That's a good place to start. Her husband also, after Hannah had a child, he said, okay, make sure that you're following what you said that you promised to God. So we know that her husband also respected and honored God. It wasn't a perfect home, but it was people that believed in and followed God. It's a good place to start. You'll find that very few people in this life are born into perfect homes. I like to think that my wife was, but, you know, sometimes I see that even there, there's some things that are just amiss. But when a person loves God, they honor God, that is a great place to start. That's why we're, we're looking for a pastor right now. And my main concern is, what is their relationship with God? Because if you love God and you're following God, a lot of other things fall into place, which is what we're going to go over today. So Hannah, she obeys the, the, the promise that she made to God, so she gives the boy to the church at a very young age, say like three, four years old. She gives Samuel to serve at the temple. But what kind of environment did she give Samuel to? You would like to think that if you trust your children to the church, that they're going to go into a great environment and they're going to be taken care of and led to Jesus, or led to God, right? Is that the case with Samuel? Let's look at chapter 2 and go down to verse 12. Eli was the head uh, high priest. His sons would be priests in the temple. Chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Now that's the problem. What is their job? Their one job is to bring people to God, to teach people to God, to be mediators between God and man. Their whole job is to teach people about God. It's a problem if your job is to teach people about God and you don't know God. Can, can we all agree on that? Does Eli know God? He does. Is he innocent? No. Let's look down at verse 22. Chapter 2, verse 22. It said, now Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons were doing in all Israel, how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent and meeting. 23, he said to them, why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good, which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one sins against another, God will mediate for him, but if one sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? So Eli knows what's going on. More than that, when God had brought people out of the land of Egypt and he had taken them to Sinai, he gave them the Ten Commandments and he gave them all kinds of uh, things to follow. Uh, they were all to point to Jesus. The sacrifices, the tent, everything. He said, I'm going to live with you, build me a house, and I want you to do certain sacrifices this is the way you do it. You do the sacrifice, you burn the fat, you drain the blood, don't eat the blood, don't eat the fat. These priests, they would go and, and they would boil the meat. It really takes the blood out, right? These priests would go along and before they could boil the meat, they say, oh, you just sacrificed? Uh, give me whatever meat I want with the fat because I don't want it boiled, I want to roast it in the fire. That lamb, that offering represented Jesus. So they were dishonoring not only God's command, but the picture of what God was supposed to do for them in the future. Eli knew that they were doing this, 
And if we turn the page, we see that there's a prophet that came. Verse 27, then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, did I not indeed reveal myself? You know, it gives him the story of how he came to be the high priest and says, you know, I loved Aaron. I said that I was going to have a high priest from his family forever, but I cannot continue the way things are. And he says, verse 29, why do you kick at my sacrifice? and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering for my people. Eli not only knew what his sons were doing, but he was getting fat off of it. What is Eli's job? He is the main person that is supposed to bring people to God. He is the only person that can go into God's room once a year. The only person that can stand in front of God and confess the sins of the people to God. He is the main mediator between God and man. He is in Jesus' position before Jesus is born, if that makes sense. He's an imperfect person, so he has to make sacrifices, but that is the role that he has. And yet, he's getting fat off the corruption of his sons. So God sends a prophet. Now, if God wants to give his word out, who's he supposed to go to? Or who is he usually going to go to? The one that should be closest to God, right? Eli's job is to be closest to God. So you see a huge, huge problem here, right? Now let's go down here to Samuel's calling. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Whose job was it to give the word of the Lord to the people? Eli. So if the word of the Lord was rare in those days, what does that tell you about the spiritual life of Eli? And this is the people that Hannah said, take care of my boy. Verse 2, and it happened at that time that Eli was laying down in his own place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim, and he couldn't see very well, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was laying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. I'm going to tell you right now, that is not true. But it is all about perception. There were rooms right beside the temple where the people that served in the temple had each their own room. The reason I say it was not true was because only one person could be in the room where the temple of God was. That was Eli, and that was once a year. There is no way that Samuel was sleeping in the room where the ark of God was. But they each had their own room, and you see how they viewed that room. You see, to Eli, that was his house. That's what he deserved. But to Samuel, that room was the closest that he could get to God. Huge difference of perception. So we all know the story. Samuel's laying down, and he hears this voice, Samuel. And he jumps to his feet because he is a great, great pathfinder. He jumps to his feet. He wants to help out. He thinks it's Eli that's calling him. He runs over there and says, Eli, Eli, what do you want? You called me. Eli says, I didn't call you. Go to bed. Get some sleep. You got a lot of work to do tomorrow. So he goes back and lays down. When he lays down, he hears Samuel. Jumps to his feet again. Eli, Eli, you called me. What do you want? I didn't call you. Go lay down. You're hearing things. Eli has become so deaf spiritually that he can't hear God. 
Isn't that scary? The second time he says, or the third time he says, um, I can't remember, is it second or third? <laughs> third, third time he says, sorry, uh, momentary thing there. Third time, he runs in there and Eli understands what's going on. Why do you think Eli understood what was going on? I hear, I see hands. Kept coming back. Eli at one time had heard that voice. He knew what it was supposed to sound like. He no longer heard that voice. So he says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Speak. So Samuel goes back, he lays down, God gives him a message. That message is, Eli's in trouble, his sons are in trouble, I'm about to do something really bad to him. Samuel wakes up, he doesn't want to tell what God said. Eli corners him and says, look, I need you to tell me what happened, otherwise, whatever he said is going to happen to me, let it be done to you. That is a horrible curse to give to a kid, isn't it? Again, shows Eli's heart is not in the right place. I love these kids. I came from a home of some pretty strong abuse. To me, taking care of those kids, I would give my life to protect those kids. Anybody messes with my kids, they're messing with me. And he says, oh, no, no, whatever happens, let it be to you. So Samuel tells him, what is his reaction? Verse 18, chapter 3, verse 18. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, as the Lord, let him do what he wants to do. Now, you guys all drive cars, most of you. Maybe not the shorter people. Most of you drive cars, some better than others, but they all have one thing in common. They all have four tires. If I go out there and I see this nice Mercedes Benz and it's got a flat tire, and I tell the driver, hey, you got a flat tire. He says, eh, if it's flat, it's flat, and drives off and I see him like screeching out and you know, headed towards the freeway, I'm gonna think the guy's a fool. Right? Because you have warned him, and he didn't do anything about it. God has warned Eli now three times, once through the people, once through a prophet, once through a child. And Eli says, ah, whatever happens, happens. Because Eli didn't know God. What is the result of having a leader that doesn't know God. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 4. Everybody seemed to know that Samuel was a prophet at this time. They started, you know, coming to Samuel, and, but they didn't, they were still following these bad leaders. It says, thus the word of Samuel came to all, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now all Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle and camped beside Ebenezer. Did God tell them to go fight? I don't read that anywhere in here, right? The Philistines drew up to battle array and met Israel. The battle spread disastrous for Israel. Let's jump down to um, verse 3, when the people came back into the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us this day? When you don't know God and something bad happens, the first thing you do is, God did it. If we know God, we know God doesn't work like that. Say, well, there's something going on here, but I know God is good, I know God loves me, I know God is going to take care of me, so let's figure out what else is going on here. Their reaction, God did it. 
Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that it, not God, it, the Ark, may come among us and it, the Ark, deliver us from the power of the enemies. See, they have learned religion so much, they've started to worship the ark instead of the God that sits on. Do you, know, do you know, guys know what the Ark of the Covenant is? God decided, I'm going to live with my people. Build me a house, put it in the center, and I want you to make it, give me a room, make a room that the priests can come and see me, and then outside make a room, make an opening that everybody can come, but I need my room. In that room, give me a box. Put a golden seat on it. Put golden cherubims facing each other. And on that seat, between those cherubim, was God. The ark was quite literally God's throne on earth. If you read Ezekiel, you'll see that Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel sees this picture of God, and he sees these beings that are moving around, these beings that are moving with God, and it says in verse 12, I believe, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, wherever the Spirit was about to go, the beings went. They anticipated God's movement and went in the direction that God wanted to go, but these people said, let us Take God and move him where we want to go. By the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I know, I know, the guy looking like this. Did he just say that verse about bodies being the temple of God? Yes! I need, it, it, this was a difficult sermon for me because I look at some things in my life that I need to change. If our bodies are the temple of God, are we sometimes taking God where he is not asking to go? So they take God where he doesn't ask to go, thinking that they can force God into doing what they want. They're worshiping a box instead of God because you have leaders that don't know God, that just know religion. And they get a huge slaughter. The ark is taken. The strange thing is, the Philistines understood God more than what the Israelites did at that point. As soon as the ark came into the camp... It says, verse 7, chapter 4, verse 7, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe is to un unto us, for nothing like this has ever happened before. Who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians in all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. They remembered. Not only that, if you skip down to chapter 5, after they took the ark, it says, now the Philistines, chapter 5, verse 1, now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. There were five cities of the Philistines. They brought it to Dagon. Dagon, the best temple for Dagon for the entire world was not Ashdod. It was Gaza. But, just a little bit before this story, Samson knocked down the temple in Gaza, which is most likely why they took the thing, why they took the ark to Ashdod. They have recent memory of what God can do. They respect God more than the people that are supposed to be God's kids. Why? Because you had leaders that didn't know God. But, what happens when you have a leader that does know God? Let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 7. See, so the Philistines, God started saying, God started doing things that the Philistines really didn't just 
did not want God's ark in their land anymore. They sent it back. After they sent it back, Samuel, verse 3, chapter 7, verse 3, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you will return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone, he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Do you notice a different message here? The message of the leaders that didn't know God said, I want that, give it to me. The message of the leader that did know God said, it's not about me. If you will direct your heart to God, God will save you. God loves you. He will deliver you. Serve him. He will take care of you. It's not about me. It's about showing these guys who God is. So, it says they took uh, all the Asherah, they took all the false gods away from him. Verse 4, they removed the Baals, the Asherah, started serving God alone. And then God, uh, then Samuel calls a prayer meeting. Verse, uh, verse 5, Samuel said, gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. They gathered to Mizpah and poured out... Um, poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the son, said Mizpah. The next thing that happens, a true leader that follows God, he brings people to God. The people repent. They say, yes, this is a God I want to serve. They say, what do I need to do in my life that I can properly serve God? It's not about us saying, you need to change this, 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 and this about your life. It's about bringing them to God. We are not the Holy Spirit. Amen? <laughs> we just are people that love God so much, we want to show other people the God that we love. Now, when you decide to follow God, whether you are, if you are a person that knows God, you decide you're going to follow God, problems are going to come up. It's going to happen. So, the Philistines, verse 7, the Philistines heard the sons of Israel had gathered to Mizpah, and the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and the sons of Israel heard it, and they were afraid of the Philistines. But when you have a leader that knows God, not only do they bring people to God, and then people want to change their lives and you know, let God have full control of their hearts, but it grows faith. This time, instead of saying, let's grab the ark and take God where, we, where he is not asking to go, they said to Samuel, verse 8, Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry to the Lord God for us, that he may save us. Not the ark, but that God may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for the burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. By the way, it is really dangerous to bust up a prayer meeting. So Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them so that they were routed before Israel. That's the difference. It's not about whether you are great at crafts. It's not about whether you can teach nature honors. If you want to grow great leaders, every one of these are future and present leaders. You cannot lead until you know how to follow. That's something I learned as a Marine. You want to lead, learn to follow. You cannot lead in the right direction unless you are following Jesus. If you're not following Jesus, you aren't going the right direction, so wherever you go is going to lead people wrong. So to lead, you must learn 
to follow, to lead, I must learn to follow. And this is the one that hurts me the most. I have to be careful to follow so I am not trying to take God to a place where he isn't asking to go. Today we're introducing new pathfinders to our club. But it's not just our club. I would ask all of the people who have ever been a pathfinder, please stand. And pathfinders, stand up please. Look around you. It's a big group, right? It's not just this church. If I go into any church, I'm sure you're going to have people standing. This isn't something where we just welcomed you into this club. We just welcomed you into a worldwide organization, a family, where we are inviting you to follow as we follow. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Pathfinders, welcome to our family. Look around you at all the people that you can rely on to help you as you learn to follow and as you learn to lead. Thank you very much. You guys can sit down.